our next mountain of assignment, our next mountain of inheritance, mountain where we have a call, responsibility, authority, privilege, is the mountain of family. As we go through these mountains, every one of these mountains as we go through can seem as the most important mountain. And surely a great case can be made for this being the most important mountain. But again, that same case can be made for all of the other mountains also. The mountain of family is the mountain that's been under tremendous assault. Uh, maybe like never before, we have families fractured and broken. You know, just the nature of, of, of morality in this day and age has uh, contributed greatly to there being a, a foundational fracturing of the family unit. And a family unit, when it's fractured, it creates fractured community, which then creates fractured nations. And um, I do believe the Lord has great resources, anointings, help uh, for this mountain. And I believe he is uh, calling, and, and I believe many of you will even hear a call today, tonight, uh, where the Lord begins to recruit you into this mountain of family where you understand a little more the nature of, of your mission. Obviously, anybody who has a family, you have a mini mission just taking care of your own family. But there becomes, uh, there, there comes an ability to expand that influence as we understand who we are and what he's empowered us to do. There's a general principle for all the mountains. When you know the authority and responsibility given you, when you're wearing in the spirit your uniform as ambassador of the king, son of the king, there is an exponential increase of the release of favor and potential that can take place through your life. And angels will be signed up to you to assist you because you're now living not just for yourself, not just for survival, not just trying to make it you know, to the next paycheck or whatever it is, but you now have an understanding that where you live and walk is your mission field and there is your platform and pulpit in some way or another. Scripture we want to start with, turn to, is Malachi 4, 5, and 6. Well-known scripture, but it's uh, strategically placed uh, in, you know, it's the last chapter of the Old Testament. The scriptures will be silent for 400 years till Jesus himself is coming or on the horizon. And it, it begins to speak uh, of, of an important time in the future. And, and my, the name of my first book was A Seven Mountain Prophecy, The Coming Elijah Revolution. And the, the Elijah Revolution is something that is to affect all the mountains, but there is a, a specific, uh, specifically targeted even to this mountain of family as we re read it in Malachi 4, 5, and 6. It says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, and he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to the fathers, lest I come and strike the world with a curse. We understand that if nothing else, if we didn't understand any other thing in Scripture, just the power of, this, of these two verses would be overwhelming. That before the Lord returns, or whatever you want to call the great and dreadful day of the Lord, it is simultaneously great and dreadful, that he would send Elijah the prophet. And again, there can be another discussion on whether that's Elijah the prophet literally, because he did go to heaven. It's appointed unto man once to die. He's never died. So some think that he could be the one coming back and initiate something to do with this. I don't know. It at minimum is the spirit of Elijah, of Elijah the prophet coming before the great and dreadful day of the Lord. But the specific mission, he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to the fathers. And that uh, phraseology, lest I come and strike the world with a curse, the understanding even of that word curse is about it being uh, physical illness. And one of the questions I get asked a lot, and so some of you may have this question, I could save you uh, from asking, asking me that later, not that I'm trying to save myself questions, but where is health care? What mountain is health care? What, what mountain is 
uh, healing take place. If we isolate it to one mountain, it is this mountain of family. And I'll explain. Perhaps 90% of all sicknesses and illnesses come from a fractured family. It's directly or indirectly. Auto, even if you go to autoimmune diseases, it's where your body begins to attack itself in a wrong way instead of attacking disease or the enemy itself. It's a, an internal manifestation of self-hatred. Even if your brain has been able to overcome self-hatred, your body inside is still manifesting self-hatred, usually because it picked up the wrong thing in childhood. It perceived and picked up rejection in some way, and so it's continued to manifest that way. And then, whether we go into discussing 40 million orphans' aids in, in Africa, we realize that the majority of those are going to be the product of somebody who went outside the biblical norms for sexual activity. And so, again, a dysfunctioning or misfunctional uh, a misfunctioning family is a source of disease. Um, uh, even promiscuity, there is a tie-in, scientific tie-in between uh, a dysfunction, a fracture in the family, and those who go into that. And, and just, you know, study after study after study, we could make it overwhelming. I think most of you know it who have studied it. That 90% of our illnesses and sicknesses come from unhealthy families. Unhealthy families release sickness. And so the best way you can bring health is to strengthen and restore families if you feel like you're called to do so. And just to do so in the traditional, you know, traditional medical profession, as you know, you're treating symptoms. And there are, you know, to stop the pain, but it's not a healing agent. Because healing takes place in a different way. You know, there's practical things. Yeah, if you break, you know, break a leg in your leg and you get a cast, it, it does, it's taking care of, the, you know, the exact problem is being taken care of. You don't need a, a counseling thing for the broken bone in general. Just straight cast is good. But there is, a, uh, um, uh, there is an understanding about, uh, let me expand even this thing of, of sickness and health. Even what healing ministries are, you feel like, you know, the, the solution for the world, if we could have enough healing crusades where, where we just had tremendous healings from God taking place. I used to think that and believe that, and so many of you might. And I still believe we're going to have great healing crusades. But I want to explain to you what healing crusades are doing and what healing ministries are doing. Healing ministries are at the bottom of all seven mountains with an eraser, erasing the consequences of principalities being unchallenged. I already was speaking to you of the mountain of media, how because Apollonian and the Hittites are releasing bad news and anxiety, it literally changes the health. And so we are getting sickness from that mountain. The mountain of government, when it's run by corruption and arrogance, the people under that type of mountain are, are stressed out. That is a source of, uh, of uh, lack of health. Not only that, that's still the number one way people die is their own governments killing them around the world. Um, and, and, and so the mountain of government, when the principality is unchallenged, there's death, lack of health, sickness. Mountain of media, the same way. We'll get to the mountain of celebration, where Jezebel's there, through seduction and, and, and addiction, there is a whole other level of sickness, disease being released. We go mountain by mountain, even the mountain of religion, where we'll get to that, where the religious spirit rules and reign, reigns. It kills the supernatural, and so there's disease coming from that. The tops of all the mountains are releasing toxic disease into society. That's why we're never going to have as much success as we wanted to with healing crusades. It's not the, the answer. It is the eraser answer. But we've got to begin to write things into the fabric of society that release healing. His desire for us, according to the New Testament, is that we be in health, not just that we get healed. Being in health is when the systems of this world represent the face of God in every sector, in every mountain of society. Y'all get that? All right. That's important. 
the spiritual landscape of the mountain of family. Again, we're going to one of the enemy nations of the promised land of Israel. This was a template, the original template the Lord gave me and said there was a correlation between each one of the enemies and the, and the principality and both the strategy and the lie that the enemy was advancing on the mountain. And I'll continue to say this. There is a relatively simple strategy and plan that the enemy has on every mountain. And we have to understand that it's our assignment, our job, to go and counter that. We come in the opposite spirit of what the enemy is doing there. The mountain of media, he wants to release bad news, bad news, bad news. It conditions the people to receive seeds of darkness. And, and mountain of government, corruption, corruption. Any way he can cause corruption, bribes, corruption, uh, he has destroyed the integrity of the face of God on that mountain, and he brings death. To steal, steal, kill, and divide in every way possible is what he's trying to do. So we are there not just to get people saved, but we have to heal structures. We have to represent his heart, his image, his face in the structures himself of society and bring the health of God, the health of heaven in that way. The spiritual landscape of the mountain of family, the enemy, the Jebusites. Jebusites represent rejection. That is the demon that torments us so that Baal might take us. And we're going to talk a little bit about rejection as we go on in this, in this brief teaching because it becomes so uh, central for us to understand both things in ourself and how we may be healers, deliverers on this particular mountain, how the Lord could give us structures, infrastructures, um, uh, you know, the creative programs, um, uh, how to, uh, to heal and restore this particular situation. The principality on the mountain is Baal. So the ites always represent the run-of-the-mill demons and the lies that are being advanced. And then the principality is Baal. So he is the one that operates on the mountain of family. As you may know, many of the leaders of spiritual warfare uh, network in our, in our nations believe Baal is the primary principality of the United States. It may or may not be. I don't really care. I consider the principality to be Jesus and God because he paid the supreme price with his blood. And so every other power and principality is there in an illegal way. So they may be operating there illegally, but there's only one who paid the price for the United States of America. And he has asked the Father that this nation be a sheep nation. And so it is imperative that sons and daughters of the king understand this about him and not join in the accusation the enemy makes against this nation, but join in and being delivers for our nation. So let's talk a little bit about the principality Baal. His name means Lord of Jezebel, interestingly enough, or husband of Jezebel. They work together. It is the spirit of perversion that is behind homosexuality, abortion, cutting oneself, etc., you want to explain that so it's understandable. If you remember the story in 1 Kings 18, when Elijah confronted the prophets of Baal, when they couldn't get Baal to answer, it says, and they cut themselves as was their custom. You know, our teenagers, it's very possible, some in this room, some listening, or your kids, it is an amazing uh, uh, thing. I don't know what else to call it, tragedy uh, going on uh, right now that are, so many of our young people are cutting themselves. I'm sure uh, if we had a show of hands, you either know of, of someone or it's been close to home to you. And that is a conditioning of self-rejection by the principality Baal. And uh, it is a, a, a pre-suicidal uh, attempt of the enemy. It doesn't mean they're going to go into that. But that is the way they're dealing with their pain also. They're dealing with their pain. But it is something, it is, again, it's interesting that Scripture speaks of Baal and that they would cut themselves. And that's what we see manifesting. And you'll see it particularly those who are struggling with issues in their family. Issues in their family are generally what causes them uh, to cut themselves. And this, nobody uh, this time is not, it's instructive rather than anybody to get under uh, shame, condemnation about this. We don't have time to go into the ministry uh, version of this. This is just laying out the landscape of this, of this mountain in a more big picture way. 
Um, as I pointed out, that was 1 Kings 18.28, if you want the specific scripture on it. So they cried aloud and cut themselves, as was their custom, with knives and lances until the blood gushed out on them. But it was Elijah who was short-circuiting the power of Baal. The spirit of Elijah short-circuits the power of Baal. The source of all this is uh, the rejection, and, and, and we want to understand the wiles of the enemy um, and how he goes about this. You know, from, the, uh, from, the, from before you're born, the enemy is attempting to release rejection upon you. We're pointing out how sensitive you can be. We're 90%, 99% uh, water as an embryo, 90% water when you are uh, born and the power of words over water. And so uh, a fetus can pick up a rejection. And from the moment you are conceived, the enemy is trying to give you a scar, a wounding of rejection. He's working at every possible way because this, if he can get his foot in the door with either rejection or perceived rejection, then he has uh, opened the door for the principality of Baal to begin working on you. And you just want to be aware of him trying to do that. And so if you're called to be a healer on this mountain, you want to understand that the initial thing the enemy did in someone's life who looks very wounded now at some point early on, uh, even possibly before they were born, most likely in their first early years, is do something where they would choose to believe they are rejected. They either were or they believe they were. So point out even the cutting of oneself is a visible manifestation of self-rejection, internalized self-rejection, self-hatred will often show up as an autoimmune disease as I was mentioning earlier. Homosexuality is Baal worship. If you didn't know, the actual worship of Baal in biblical times involved homosexual activity, overt homosexual activity. This is what they performed, what they practiced. And homosexual prostitution was part of Baal worship that did take place. And this is where self-rejection has progressed to rejection of one's own sexuality. There's a lot of confusion, a lot of mishandling of the issue of homosexuality by the church itself, and, and a lot of discussion about where it comes from. Is someone born with it or not born with it? I can't go into the depths of it, but I'll make a point that even if someone were born with it, would not justify it. I have four daughters. Every one of them was born selfish, greedy, mine. And, and if we didn't put some barriers, they probably would all turn into murderers. You're born, you're born wanting yours, your own, and even a, a, a uh, you know, Heterosexual drive uh, is not, by drive, the instinct itself is not uh, just for one. So there's this understanding that we obey the instruction of God as it relates to how we operate with our behavior. Our behavior is not self-justified just because we feel it. Again, that's core Satanism. Do as you will. Of course, and so it really the argument is not if you're born with it or not born with it. Uh, I'm, uh, we were all born with all kinds of urges we're not supposed to keep doing. I don't think you're supposed to keep peeing on people. And <laughs> throwing up on people, spitting up on people's back. You know, there's adjustments made once you understand a correct standard. Having said that, I don't believe... Uh, uh, I don't believe if there are any born that way, I don't believe there are hardly any born that way. Uh, because I believe there is something that took place very, very young. The devil is as a roaring lion. He seeks to devour, and he does something very early, and even the statistics and the studies will bear out that most who uh, um, uh, struggle with homosexuality, there was particularly a, a sexual abuse perpetrated against them. Many times they may not know about it, uh, or sometimes they may not know, but that is part of of the enemy. And so in it, it internalized what happens internally, not even in the brain, internally there is a self-rejection of one's own sexuality. So in the self-rejection of your own sexuality, it comes out, it's a 
diverted, perverted thing. Not trying to say it in a way of oh, a shameful perverted, but it's just, you know, perverted. it's just a twisted manifestation of how it's supposed to be. That's the devil's assignment, really on every mountain, to twist what God has given as a gift. The great gift of sex that God provided, that sex was God's idea, it never was Satan's idea. It wasn't like this Satan's idea and God's trying to figure out what to do with it. This was God's gift, God's idea. Satan is the great counterfeiter. He is the great perverter. It's how he works in every area of society, but particularly we see this here. Let me just add a, a, a little more. The church really has to begin uh, coming to a new level of wisdom, understanding, and anointing as it relates to uh, just this uh, uh, homosexual struggles and what our role should be. And uh, at times, you know, it's like there's two branches of the church right now. There, are, there is the church that want to make sure that before the person has even entered the door, they understand. We have a standard of no homosexuality here. Homosexuality is a sin. We want you to know that before you ever show up in here. Well, if I'm pointing out to you that the core root problem is rejection, then the one place that could bring some healing is now making sure they can't get the healing from the church. And so, you know, any more than, you know, there's uh, most churches, we don't want it, we don't recommend it, but there's fornication, adultery taking place in church. You don't need to make sure that that is out there before anybody ever shows up. Before you ever come in, we'll make sure if you're in adultery, fornication, uh, or if you're lying, because that's sin too. You know, there's all kinds of sin. You don't, you don't need to make that the, the big issue. Before you cross over, make sure you understand our standard. And if we just understand the heart of Jesus. He was a friend first. The standard came later. It's not that we dropped the standard. It's just there is a time where that comes out in a natural way. And it doesn't need to be, you know, your broadcast position. If you're, if you're a church that's marching against homosexuality, there's almost no way a homosexual looking for the love of Christ is going to walk into your church. It's just a reality. So because some churches have understood that, they then are, uh, you know, they've changed the standard. They've changed the scripture. Homosexuality is all right. And the reason they've come with that is, and I understand that as a pastor, you, you've actually, I've actually ministered to so many that do not want to be, and they've cried, and they've repented, and they've asked God, and they don't seem to be able to change. And so when you can't change, at some point you just say, well, let me just accept it. Well, there are testimonies beginning to come out, and we will have to access a greater grace and anointing. And that becomes, that's why there's an aspect of this, the onus is on us as the church to begin to access a greater uh, anointing and part of the anointing uh, will be released as we even understand the problem in a better way and its source uh, uh, of rejection. But I can assure you that if, uh, you know, if a church has in one year a thousand former homosexuals come through and their testimony of the world is, I was totally delivered. I was prayed, Jesus came, he touched me, I no longer have those desires. And then you go five years later and they say, we're still like that. Then there is this hope released into the gay community, the homosexual community, that there is, it's, it's a changeable situation. We just don't have enough record of, uh, of, of, of success for them to have hope for that. So it's, you know, it's a complicated uh, matter and issue, but this is all, um, as this becomes all things we have to progress and step into uh, uh, with understanding, anointing, and wisdom. All right. I point out that homosexuality is an, uh, an extension of abuse and self-rejection, and it also happens as an extension of perverse explorations, particularly in a culture that's under Jezebel, where there is just like you just push the next envelope, you gotta, you got to find the next buzz, and it, you mix it with drugs and everything else. You can open yourself up to a demon of homosexuality just by exploration, and, and not because there was an original wounding. We want to see, as Baal worship progresses, we want to recognize that abortion is a form of Baal worship. And this is also biblical. Cutting oneself was Baal worship. Homosexual activity was Baal worship intentionally. And abortion was Baal worship. And this is where self-rejection has now advanced to the rejection of one's own continuity. Your children, your child, 
that which would be an extension of you. The internal the re self rejection is so profound that you uh, have uh, little or no problem um, just getting rid of that. And I say that knowing that there's probably people listening who, who have uh, had an abortion and the Lord's hopefully already healed you of the shame and you've uh, repented and understood what you did and all that. So this is not about revisiting that in any way. But we'll show you the scripture, Jeremiah 32, 35. And they built the high places of Baal, which are in the valley of the son of Hinnom, to cause their sons and their daughters to pass through the fire to Molech. This abomination to cause Judah to sin. So this thing of passing through the fire to Molech, their sons and their daughters, becomes a manifestation. This, is, this was an altar to Molech, which is one of the Baals. And this was how they worshipped uh, this deity, this false deity, this, this demon. And this is where, when rejection, again, it starts, uh, it, 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 the enemy just tries to put his foot in the door, and then it can progress into all of these things. That's why it all starts with uh, the, the rejection and how you respond to that, and then you can be uh, conditioned to open yourself up to distortions, perversions of, of how you're supposed to live and walk. And we could go into more um, uh, details there, but it's most important. Just we, we begin to understand, not think of people who perform. It's not like just that evil people perform abortions. It's broken people, people that have been attempted to uh, the enemy has been working on for a long, long time. He has gone after them in different ways. And for all these, uh, whether we talk about cutting oneself or participating in homosexual act activity, there is, uh, these become manifestations, not that someone's bad, uh, but that there has, uh, there has been an initial defilement probably of them in some level. We won't say in the cutting themselves specifically that there's been defilement of them. All right. We want to go again into our, our role, the important role of pastors. Every one of these mountains, we're pointing out that there is one of the fivefold ministry that has a specific uh, role on this mountain, not the traditional fivefold ministry that shows up on the mountain of religion where the church is. So that's apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. And we have shared how there are evangelists on the mountain of media, how there's prophets in the, in the, in the mountain of economy and, and teachers in the mountain uh, of, of education and apostles in the mountain of, of government. And on this mountain of family, this becomes a place for pastors to show up. And this becomes a place where many, many of God's people, maybe many, some to many of you and many of those listening, who have had a burning in your heart to be a pastor, I want to be a pastor, and you have a pastoral heart, and you have thought and assumed that it was supposed to take place behind a pulpit or in a church. But the Lord may now be giving you instruction that your call and assignment is not on the mountain of religion, but it could be over here on the mountain of family. And, and it really is, as we'll get into a little bit, it's, it, we'll get to understand it's really a shame how we've not recognized this mission field, how we've not recognized that this is our, our pulpit and our platform where we need to show up in a very practical way. And because of it, there's much more uh, suffering than, we, than, than needs to be. But I believe the Lord is waking up his, his sons and daughters to understanding that. And I mentioned here female pastors, women pastors become a major part of the corrective force. We're now going into what the Lord has sent as the antidote, as the help. He's got the anointing, the mantle. Again, every one of these fivefold ministries is a mantle, is an anointing that carries angels and it carries help with them, carries favor of God. And we understand that the body of Christ is changing and will continue to change in a positive way as women are given their proper room and authority in, in the household of God, in the household of faith. And, and that uh, the, the, the very real truth is that uh, women make, I'm saying a generalization that some could boo or cheer, but women make better pastors as far as the pastoral aspect of a pastor. We're not saying like church leadership. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. But as far as the intuitive nature of a woman, how they have more built-in tenderness and compassion, they're just made more pastoral. And so when, when we keep them out of church we are, and keep them out of significant positions of influence, we are, we are creating internally in a church a, a, a reality where we have less tenderness and compassion than we should have. And this uh, becomes 
of course, very true for the mountain of uh, this, this this mountain of family where we where we need many of female pastors. Again, maybe this will get out to. Uh, in regions and places where there are people that are part of churches and denominations that you're never going to have a chance or opportunity to be a traditional female pastor there, a woman pastor there, and maybe God is letting you know that you are called on the mountain of family and you can be used in even a greater uh, manner, greater fashion there. There's marketplace apostles and, and I mean marketplace pastors, uh, that terminology apostles also for something else, but marketplace pastors I have a friend of mine who the Lord gave him an instruction how to uh, uh, start a bank, and, and uh, the Lord told him, I want you to be pastor of your bank. And so he even had people call him pastor, and he was to consider the people of his, his employees there and everyone who came in as people under his influence, his pastoral influence. And so he carried that understanding into the marketplace that, he, that his place of business was also, yeah, he'd do the business deal, take care of that first. He would say the customers would come in, they'd discuss their loans and whether they should have it or not when they're done. He would say, listen, I do this too, but I'm a pastor. Do you have any needs in your life? Do you need anything you need to be prayed for? And I, it was amazing. He had like, you know, in the first year, 80-something people would come to the Lord and 50-something were healed, just him doing that and all kinds of other testimonies. Want to begin to recognize our pulpits and platforms. They're all over the place. We're all fighting for this one here, but only 1% is ever going to get a chance to be here, and they may not be that good either. <laughs> so we have pulpits and platforms all over the place, Un discovered pulpits and platforms and this is one of the biggest one the most important he will send the spirit of elijah on his sons and daughters because he needs to restore the heart of the heart of the fathers towards the sons and the heart of the sons towards the fathers government service government services pastors now what i'm specifically speaking about i assume you have them here in the west coast also is you have the department of defects department of family and children's services uh, and in various nations, they're called different things. But um, uh, in Atlanta, Georgia, where I'm from, we have the Department of Family and Children's Services. And they are the first line of defense. When there's a problem, there's abuse in the family, the first ones called are defects. And even pastors are supposed to report to defects if they find out about uh, something taking place in their own uh, membership, and yet we haven't recognized that as a place where we could have influence. We'll say we're a pro-family uh, uh, church, and, and many uh, churches uh, will announce themselves as being, you know, we're for the family, we're for strong families, but often families have already been broken and rebroken several times before they ever get to the church. We're not hitting them on the first line of defense. We're hitting them generally after they've been broken several times, and, and we're missing an opportunity. Places like the Department of Family and Children's Services need to be stocked entirely, would be uh, the idea, with kingdom pastors, kingdom sons and daughters of the king. Every position there from the top, you know, the first responders should be those who understand they are pastors, but not in the traditional sense inside the church. Where better could they show up and provide the help from, that only can come from the kingdom of God? And so this is, uh, this is something uh, the Lord really wants us to wake up to. Uh, wake up to and if, uh, uh, and I, just, I just, even as I'm speaking, I feel the heart of the Lord and his desire to say, sons and daughters, show up on that mountain. Fill that mountain. Make yourself available. This is a place of bringing practical strength, restoration, and healing in every way. Another Judges who are pastors. Again, we're looking at how do these pastors look. On these other mountains, we're stealth. We don't, you know, we don't wear a pastor something. You know, we don't wear the name tag. And people don't say pastor so-and-so in general, even though the one banker was, was doing that. You, you show up outside of your uniform, we'll say. You're in a, in a stealth mode. And there are judges that are called to be pastors. You can be called to be a judge and, and called to the legal uh, uh, or governmental uh, uh, mountain. But there are some that will be called by God. They're already there right now, and some are beginning to awaken to why God placed them there to start with. But you know, there are judges that are specifically, their specialty is ruling as it relates to families. And in different nations, it's more specifically so that there are judges that have great latitude. There really are judges. Someone can come up, and a judge is going to determine whether a young man who's 17 years old who did drugs, if he goes to jail 20 years, or he gets six months of, of probation. That's a heavy responsibility for people who don't have access to the Holy Spirit. 
we should be filling all those slots. And so we should be there, and we're to be the ones we ask the Holy Spirit for wisdom and help because it's only, it takes wisdom from on high. You can't tell, you know, you know just by, by what was done, uh, you can't tell just uh, the judging. You require the wisdom. Like Deborah judged God's people, there needs to be the Holy Spirit bringing that wisdom. And then lawmakers who are pastors. These would be lawmakers who understand that it is their assignment on the mountain of government to go influence legislature, laws, and everything uh, as it relates to families. And so you're, in a way, on the mountain of government, but you're representing the interests of family. And so you're there looking at all aspects having to do with family and recognizing laws and ordinances that are damaging to family. You know, there was uh, the initial laws that came out pro for welfare. There was maybe a heart of compassion to assist those uh, uh, um, who had had uh, difficult things happen in life. But the reality of those laws and ordinances is that they further broke down families. They have been damaging, those are, uh, very damaging to family. You know, just the one, if we speak of the idea, there was, okay, a heart of compassion. If a single mom has a child, we want her to have financing for it. And so it's like, well, if you're a single mom, have a child, the government will give you money. Well, what, what you do when you don't understand the full process, don't operate in wisdom, you don't change that ordinance, is then a mother gets an understanding that every child I have, I get more money from the government. And so then you got like, and, and as long as I'm not married. And so it's anti-family ordinance. So you want to have eight kids with no husband because if you get married, you lose government help. So you have an initiative from the government for you to stay a fractured family. That's an ordinance that has to be changed. You want to manifest a compassion in some other way. You want to have incentives from law and government that strengthen family. What if it was more profitable financially for you to remain a family. There are, there are governmental ordinances that don't have to go overly into, into, you know, getting in our business in a wrong way that can strengthen family. And so we want to have those that can recognize that and be a part of that. These are just some of the initial ideas. On all these mountains, things I'm telling you, I'm giving you, you know, about a 40-minute uh, uh, overview and understanding of these mountains. And even what I'm sharing is just the initial uh, uh, outbreak of revelation as it relates to how we're supposed to invade these mountains. But it's to give you enough of an idea that, you know what, once you start thinking of the enemy piece by piece, mountain by mountain, it's like, this is not that impossible, and on the other hand, it is impossible, but we're called to do the impossible mission. You know, we have a God for the impossible. He says the nations that you're going to invade are greater and mightier than you, but you shall not say they're greater and mightier than you because I'm with you, and I'm the difference maker. So what the Bible says about family as we close, what it says about God, Psalm 68, 5 and 6, a father of the fatherless, a defender of widows is God in his holy habitation. God sets the solitary in families. He brings out those who are bound into prosperity. Just manifests the heart of who our God is. He understands that we would all live in abject loneliness if we did not have families. And so the enemy understands that also. And that's the way he separates, conquers us by dividing us. And so he fractures our family so he can fraction our society, so he can fraction our nation. We gotta, this is the inner circle, the inner cells of, of, of a nation have to begin to be repaired through this uh, uh, salt from heaven on the demonic forces that are in, on this mountain. Oh, I gotta tell, we gotta go through dealing with rejection. This can be a, a helpful for you where you're at and as you uh, go after this problem. Dealing with rejection. Number one, you may have agreed with a lie, your perception at the time. The enemy will try to tell you and we, you know, counsel and meet people who, uh, their parents were great, but they did one wrong thing when they were eight years old, and the enemy has convinced this person that, that you know, because their uh, parent got mad one time and said, I don't know why you ever born, but it's only one time, and they said, love, 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 the whole rest of the time. The enemy will make sure and remind you that your dad said that to you when you're eight years old. Now, it's different if you were told that over and over and over. That's clear, obvious, overt rejection. But the enemy will remind you of things that aren't necessarily the truth. And if you agree with it, it's the same as if it happened. So you want to begin to identify for yourself and as you counsel others, is there actual rejection or is this agreement with a lie? Uh, because the, it, will, it will release the same fruit. Number two, rejection's poison stays active in you until you forgive the rejector. Forgiveness is about giving yourself the freedom to move on. 
So don't let them win twice by doing so. Number three, and again, each one of these points could be gone much deeper and you get into uh, counseling or allowing the Holy Spirit to show up and do great things. He will anyway. Number three, rejection is an opportunity to be fast forwarded into the purposes of God for your life. If you will properly handle rejection, it will catapult you into your destiny. And you have to realize that. We could go into the story of David. David was rejected. His dad didn't even believe he had the goods to be king, and there's a reason why he was being rejected. And then his brothers rejected him. The king says, you can't take on. Nobody believed in him. Everybody rejected, but he handled it by going to God and allowing the supernatural aspect of God to connect and release through him. He released the plutonium of his destiny by overcoming the rejection, and he was catapulted into his destiny. So rejection is an opportunity to be fast-forwarded into the purposes of God for your life. If it helps you to know this, number four, nobody has ever not been rejected. So, you know, the enemy will try to quantify your rejection as the worst ever. And again, to the degree you agree, to that degree it can do damage to you. It's very obvious that there is there's sexual abuse, there's other kinds of abuse that really uh, are harder to overcome, only harder to overcome. The harder the rejection you have to overcome, the greater catapulting you will be released into. And it will be, uh, it will release authority in your life that others don't have. You will have authority to reach those who have been uh, similarly abused and hurt. Our mission on the mountain of family, number one, fill the mountain with the pastorally hearted, i.e. those who heal rejection at every possible juncture. It's a simple thing. Fill the mountain with the pastorally hearted, shepherd hearted, those who heal rejection at every possible juncture. Becomes our mission on the mountain of family. Number two, some will have a structural mission, the institutions and laws that protect family and that give financial incentives to his well-being. This sort of re, re, restating the point that I had made a, a little while ago. And so as I'm speaking these things, if you begin to uh, feel God's passion and heart and, uh, and your heart go on fire uh, in this direction, you can begin to have an understanding that you may have a more intentional uh, assignment role mission on the mountain of family. All of us who have families or in families to some extent or another have uh, already our mini pulpit platform just to operate the way we're supposed to. Whether you're the father or the son, the mother or the daughter, the spirit of Elijah restores the heart of parents towards children and of children towards parents. There is reconciliation that goes both ways. You know, children and young people always assume that parents had to be wrong because they remember something they did wrong. And, 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 um, and, but again, the enemy can cause a, a, a minor thing, a, a molehill to be Come a mountain and, a, and, and discredit even a parent's love by pointing out one or two or, or, or you know, a few errors along the way and turning it into that's how they were. It's the distorting of news in a, in a way we can talk about. It'll point out something that happened once and then make that be the reality. And so everybody believes they came from the worst families in the, in, in the world. And there has been a lot of dysfunction and a lot of dysfunctional families. We're not, we're not stating that that hasn't been the case, but we are now going to be part of healing families and the spirit of Elijah is released to see this mountain restored and see the face of God restored in this mountain the face of Papa God bottom line when rubber hits the road when it's all said and done he's our Papa and he's a Papa and that's why he says the thing I want to do before the great and dreadful day of the Lord I want to see the hearts of fathers restored to sons and of sons to fathers and this is his heart. He is daddy. He is papa. He's the true one. He's the real one. He's the good one. He's the one that can be trusted, turned to. He's tender. He's kind. He's loving. He has humor. I just need to tell you these things if you don't know. We have had such a distortion by our own fathers of how he really is. And, uh, but he is, he's a, he's a really good daddy. And you need to know that. If you know that you're called to this mountain of family, I'm just going to ask you to stand right now. And I want to pray for you that there be a fresh anointing come upon your life. Again, as we've been pointing out, you can be called to several mountains, multiple mountains. You may not even know how you're going to do them all. But ultimately, we're called to be hinds feet on high places. We're supposed to be gazelles that dance and jump on the tops of all the mountains. And, and the further up one mountain you go, the more interaction you'll have with all the other mountains. It's just the way it works. So if you just raise your hands, those watching... 
if you can do the same thing. Lord, I just feel your heart for the broken families of our societies. And just feel your Father's heart towards us. Even these that are standing up, Lord, many of them have suffered their own traumas, their own rejection, uh, some very clear, strong abuse. And yet I see, see this room, like 90% of have stood up and said, Lord, use me. I'm on assignment in Mountain of Family. Give me the strategies. Give me the plan. Give me the ministry. Give me the solutions. I'll show up where you want, and I'll be an instrument of your healing. And so many of them, Lord, have gained great authority, even through what they've suffered, what they've overcome. Just sense the Lord's uh, his pleasure with so many of you that I'm speaking to. Just, he's saying, he just, like, he's actually telling me, he says, you don't know what some of these have had to overcome. My heart just is, is so pleased. I love my sons and daughters here. I just feel like many of you have so touched his heart just by what you've chosen to overcome and how you've chosen to press into God. And, and he is, there's a great authority, a great anointing released now uh, into your life in order for there to be a great anointing released on this mountain of family. So, Lord, raise up champions. Raise up new ideas, new ministries, new solutions. Raise up judges, lawyers, businesses, uh, all, all kinds of new models of doing things, Lord, new, uh, new child care uh, 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 methodologies that are uh, those who are who are creating them have in goal in mind to bring healing to this mountain, Lord. All kinds of innovative ideas to bring your kingdom on this mountain, Lord, and release your sons and daughters. Even as I declare this, that it happen here in this place. Those who are watching online throughout this nation, throughout the nations, may your sons and daughters arise and be the healers on the mountain of family. And we thank you that will happen. The spirit of Elijah is being released even now, an anointing from on high. The spirit of Elijah that takes out the spirit of Baal, that has authority over Baal, that allows Baal not even be able to function. Baal can't talk when the spirit of Elijah is around as it was in the time of Elijah himself. And so Lord, I thank you that this anointing be released on everyone who has stood up and said, I'm up for the part, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.